Let me, uh, yes, introduce the uh, last speaker of today's session, Evan Patterson from the Stanford, and uh, he shall speak about the algebra statistical theories and the models. Yes, please. Thanks very much. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Evan. I'm just uh, finishing up my PhD in statistics, and I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I I did for that. Um, so the motivation for this comes from a certain point of view about statistical models. So um, in statistics, there's a tradition of thinking of models not just as black boxes, but as having a, a meaningful internal structure, which is related to the do domain of, that you're working in. And an, another important aspect of statistics that one what doesn't always get from introductory textbooks is that models are not usually sort of uniquely or canonically determined by the situation that you're in. So often there might be um, a number of different competing models in a given situation and so you're interested in comparing them and, and they're related to each other in various ways. And finally, uh, I mean, it can sometimes be the case that that models are sort of purely phenomenological. That is, they're just sort of kind of made up out of out of, of thin air and hope to be useful in a particular situation. But they're often at least motivated by a more general set of of scientific theories, right? They, they don't come from they don't come from nowhere. Um, and so the objective of this project is to understand at least the, the first two points from the viewpoint of categorical logic. Um, and uh, maybe I'll say a little bit about the third at the, at the end. Um, and so because this is the uh, categorical probability and statistics workshop, I'm going to assume that um, you know some things about category theory, um, but I'm not going to assume uh, a whole lot about statistics. Um, so if you're coming from the opposite direction, well, um, hopefully you can still take something away from it, but not everything maybe will make, will make complete sense, but uh, happy to, to take questions at the end and, and in the Zulip. Okay, so um, let me just remind you um, what is the sort of classical um, understanding of a statistical model that you'll find in you know, essentially any textbook that discusses uh, decision theoretic ideas. So a statistical model is just a, a family of probability distributions that are parameterized by some set. So usually that set might be like a subset of Euclidean space and so there's a parameter space and all of those probability distributions are supported on a common space. Um, X and that's the sample space. Okay, and so the, the so the, what we think of is that this model is uh, a, a mapping which kind of defines a data generating mechanism. So for any choice of parameters, you get a data generating uh, machine, and then the in, in a single word, sort of the 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 whole goal of statistical inference is to, in some approximate sense, invert this invert this mechanism. So to find an estimator that is a mapping from the data to the parameter space such that in some suitable sense you get close to the true parameter given a sample of the data. So that is in a nutshell uh, 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 the kind of central problem of statistical inference and there are various ways of, of making that more precise. So um, in this basic setup has long history. I think like the, the, the kind of formal version of it goes back to uh, Wald's statistical decision theory. And although that definition of a statistical model is very minimalistic, um, it is still useful because you can do some, you can do things uh, with it even at that level of, of uh, simplicity. So you can define concepts like sufficiency and ancillarity and establish certain general sort of results, um, such as the Nyman-Fisher factorization criterion or Basu's theorem or some of these other classic results of statistical decision theory. And uh, 
So recently, uh, Tobias Fritz has shown that uh, su quite surprisingly, I think that you, you can reproduce a lot of this in, in a purely synthetic setting of Markov categories, which is a pretty interesting thing. Um, uh, nevertheless, the classical definition of a statistical model is sufficiently abstracted um, away from concrete models that um, it, it's, it is abstracting away from a large part of, of the practice of constructing and using models. So by describing a model just as a map, it's, it's sort of treating it as, as, a, as a black box. And it also doesn't really give a whole lot of guidance about how one might go about formalizing relationships between different statistical models. And so the point of departure for this talk is to think about, can we use ideas from logic and then eventually categorical logic to um, be more formal about the structure that statistical models have that go beyond just a mapping from parameters to um, samples. Um, and that's sort of a reasonable thing to try to do, I think, because, you know, the logic draws a helpful distinction between theories and models that you're probably familiar with. So, you know, the a logical theory is, um, it has a, a qualitative and a synthetic uh, aspect to it, which is natural for describing things that are purely structural. Whereas the models are often the sort of objects that um, are not sort of uh, finitary. They can involve, you know, all sorts of quantitative aspects. And, and another aspect of this, which is of interest to me is that the, the theory part is usually a sort of thing that can be directly encoded on a machine. That's something I'm, I'm interested in. Whereas like the models, not usually directly, right? So like the, like, so let's say that they take like the Gaussian distribution. I mean, you can do things with it approximately on a machine. Like you can approximately sample from it and you can say manipulate its density and things of this nature, but like um, you, you can't really represent the mathematical object itself directly. Okay, so, so the question that we're going to explore here as well, doesn't, if there are statistical models does it make sense to, to think about statistical theories of which they may be models in the logical sense? And that idea is not new. Um, there's a, a long tradition in the philosophy of science to try to understand uh, models in mathematical logic and models in statistics or more generally scientific models um, as somehow having some essential commonality. So, so I think the first person to really clearly articulate this was um, Patrick Supps. So here, here he is in a 19, a paper from the early 60s saying, I claim that the concept of model in the sense of Tarski may be used without distortion and as a fundamental concept in all the disciplines. And he goes on to list a number of empirical sciences. In this sense, I would assert that the meaning of the concept of model is the same in mathematics and the empirical sciences. The difference to be found in these disciplines is to be found in their use of the concept. Okay, so what is he saying? He's basically arguing that um, the, at least the, the, the concept of, of, of model of a theory can apply you know, equally well to models in science um, as in math, however, you know, the way that people use those models are, are typically different, but, but still the, the concept can be largely carried over. And, and this initiated a, a tradition, which is sometimes called the scientific view of semantic, oh, excuse, me, excuse me, the semantic view of scientific theories and various philosophers have developed different flavors of it. Subs has kind of a, a set theoretical uh, version of this. Um, and the, uh, but un unfortunately, I, I don't think that this uh, view has ever been uh, articulated in a, in a way that's sort of uh, precise enough to be, um, 
you know, instantiated, you know, on a, in, in a generic way as mathematics and on, and on a computer. And, and there are some reasons for this. I mean, one is that I think, although Supps was himself, at least in part, a statistician, many of the subsequent workers on this were not statisticians and they weren't so interested in that. So that aspect of it was not really developed. Um, and another uh, problem from the motivation of from the viewpoint of the motivation that I gave at the beginning is that if we want to understand the relationships between um, different statistical methods, um, I think logic itself doesn't give a lot of, of guidance on that because it's not necessarily easy to compare to uh, logical theories with, e with each other. Uh, and so this is where I think uh, categorical logic um, comes into this picture because um, it introduces um, a really uh, beautiful idea, which is to, um, instead of seeing there, seeing a sharp dichotomy between the syntactical world of theories and the semantical world of models, logical theories themselves become algebraic structures. So particularly they become categories of a certain kind. And, and this, uh, has a lot of really powerful consequences. So uh, one of them is that theories uh, become invariant to, uh, be, theories as algebraic structures become invariant to the way that you present them. And then uh, there's a number of, of consequences that are actually, that are very relevant to this project and that we'll, we'll make essential use of. So, um, in categorical logic, the principle of functorial semantics, which says that a model is just a certain kind of, of functor out of the, the theory category, um, makes it easy to substitute other kinds of semantics than the usual uh, one based on the category of sets and functions, right? So we're gonna use that to get probabilistic semantics in a category of, of some kind of category of Markov kernels. Um, and by substituting different kinds of categorical gadgets, you can create lots of different logical systems, one that may not uh, resemble so much the classic ones. And again, I'm going to make use of this to make a kind of, 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 of logic which seems more appropriate for statistical modeling. Um, and finally, to return to the, the original motivation, right, because theories in this viewpoint are algebraic structures. They have morphisms between them, and these we'll, we will use to formalize different relationships between statistical models. Okay, so so that is the the idea. And so here is, in a, a nutshell, the sort of dictionary that we're going to have here. So uh, in the first two columns, there's the dictionary between category theory and logic that goes back to uh, uh, Levere, but it has been extensively developed by many people since then. And um, so in this dictionary, theories are a certain kind of category, functors out of those, functors out of those categories are models of the theory. And then finally, uh, model homomorphisms are natural transformations. Okay, and so we're going to uh, try to introduce a notion of, of statistical theory, which is uh, similar in style, and then recover from that statistical models as models of those theories. And one consequence of this will, was that we'll also get a notion of, of, of homomorphism between statistical models. Okay, so to, I want to try to to continue to give context here. I want to try to explain where in the family of categorical logics this stuff fits in. So, um, algebraic theories were what were first in investigated by by Lavier, and those correspond to Cartesian categories. And since that time, people have charted out um, a, a landscape of of different. Uh, kinds of categorical structures and the logics that they correspond to. So, but we'll actually be working in a different part of the family tree. So rather than exploring these 
um, extensions of algebraic theories to incorporate more elements of first order logic or other systems. Instead, we'll be splitting where this blue arrow is um, to explore a different part. So specifically, we're going to be um, starting with the notion of, of Markov category, and uh, I'll review that in, in a bit. It's already in, in this, it has uh, appeared prominently in the workshop already. Um, and we will be adding to that some additional uh, structure sort of coming from line linear algebra, which seems um, quite useful for um, talking about sort of commonly occurring models. And we'll, we'll take that as the kind of categorical structure in which to describe statistical theories. Okay. Okay. So before I get into all that, I want to give a quick uh, informal example and later I'll come back and, and try to make it um, uh, more uh, precise, clear how that fits into the formalism. But let me just remind you uh, that you know, we'll take the linear model and let me remind you that what that is, it's, it's part of the specification of that as a design matrix. And then the sampling distribution is um, given by um, this uh, formula. So in, in, in other words, the observations are uh, a linear uh, function of the, the design um, and the parameters are, are the uh, those coefficients as well as an, an unknown variance? Okay, this is the most uh, classic and uh, model in in all of statistics, probably. So, um, and so the theory of this model will be um, a certain kind of category that's generated by um, some objects. Uh, corresponding to those to the the data and the parameters, um, as well as um, a, a morphism representing the the design and another one representing the random component of the model, and those will be subject to certain equations that that later we'll see, and then the sampling morphism, which is the other part of the specification of a theory, will be given by a, a simple composite. Of those. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Um, and then having set that up, a linear model will be a um, suitable kind of functor out of that theory. Okay, so let's, so we're going to uh, work, uh, work up to being able to do that sort of model and, and others. Um, and so the first thing that I'm going to review our uh, Markov kernels, which will um, form basically the, the category in which the semantics of statistical theories will exist. So, um, so there's been a fair amount about Markov kernels uh, so far in the workshop, but let me remind you that a Markov kernel between um, two measurable spaces is formally, it, it's a measurable map from the domain into the set of probability measures on the codomain. I mean, informally, it is a probabilistic or a randomized function. So for every point in the domain, you get a, not just a point in the codomain, but a probability distribution over the codomain. Okay, so some examples of such things which are relevant to us is, uh, well, in the first place, the classical notion of a statistical model um, can be rephrased as just a Markov kernel from the parameter space to the sample space. Um, this is a very old observation. I think the first person to really uh, to articulate it in an explicitly category theoretic way was Sinsov. Uh, and um, so he, he worked from this viewpoint and, and it's sort of a natural motivation for, for the, this project. Um, the, and then an, uh, basically, essentially any 
you know, parameterized family of probability distributions that you like, you know, the normal, the Poisson, the exponential, whatever you like, are going to be Markov kernels. So, for example, here is the 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 whole normal family parameterized by mean and variance. Let's say is a Markov kernel. Likewise, the whole you know d-dimensional normal family parameterized by a mean vector and a covariance matrix that can all be packaged up into a Markov kernel. Okay, and there are two uh, essential things that you can do with Markov kernels. So you can compose them in, in series. Um, so this operation has a natural probabilistic interpretation. So if you have Markov kernels M and N, at, like here, how would you uh, compute M followed by N at X? Well, M gives you a probability distribution on Y for that point X, and then N gives you a conditional distribution of, y, of Z given Y. So together, we get a joint distribution on Y and Z. And then to get a distribution just on Z, you marginalize out by Y, right? And that is how you compose Markov kernels. Okay, so, and then there's also a, a monodal product, I like to call the independent product, and it just says that um, to, to put them in uh, Markov kernels in parallel, you um, take the uh, independent product probability measures point-wise. Okay, and there are also operations um, for uh, copying or duplicating and uh, discarding or deleting data, and those give Markov the, those give the category of Markov kernels a, in the jargon, a supply of, of commutative comonoids. And um, having set this up, one can check that the Markov kernels obey all the laws that a Cartesian category does, except for one, which is that they do not preserve the copying operation. Um, and that is uh, an essential expression of the randomness or non-determinism. So, in fact, you can show that uh, if the Markov kernel is is well behaved, right? So you're working on not on a pathological measure space. Then, in fact, the kernel is deterministic, meaning it corresponds to just a, a function with no randomness, if and only if this this um, ex equation actually holds. Okay, and and this motivates um, a certain axiomization of categories of Markov kernels, which has been uh, explored. Um, under different names or without a name by by various people, um, and and so and what it says is that a Markov category is a symmetric monoid category with a supply of comonoids, so operations for copying and deleting, such that every morphism preserves the deleting, um, but not necessarily the copying. Okay, and so um, and like all good results are all, all sufficiently nice uh, mathematical results eventually become definitions. So, you know, th so this leads to an abstract definition of determinism in a Markov category, uh, where we say that a morphism in a Markov category is deterministic if it preserves copying, okay? And even though Markov categories are, have, have a very sort of minimalistic definition, you can already talk about quite a lot of things in them. You can talk about conditional independence. You can talk about exchangeability. You can talk about disintegration, um, specifically for Bayesian inference. And as I mentioned earlier, in this setting, you can you can formalize a number of the the abstract um, definitions and, and results of statistical decision theory. Okay. Um, Arthur, do you want to uh, say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You have, uh, yes. Sorry, is there, is there a question? No, because I see the common of the Arthur in the chat room, so. <coughs> um. Oh, sorry, it wasn't an urgent question, but I was just curious. Um, what the notion of a statistical model looked like before Senkov's work? What sort um, of data was assumed? 
in, in, in its definition or formulation? Yeah, so, so a couple, couple points. I mean, people were definitely, uh, so, so the, the classical notion which predates Synthov is that a statistical model is a parameterized family of probability distributions. And the observation that that forms a Markov kernel, I, I don't even know whether that should be attributed to Sinsov or not. I mean, it's really just a, an observation and the notion of Markov kernel is also really old. Um, I, I, what Sinsov was the first to do, I think, was to actually um, take that seriously and, and, and use it to give a, some ca category, explicitly category theoretic treatment of some ideas and statistics. Um, I believe he was the first to do that. Um, but yeah, the, the early history of, of that, uh, I don't know all the, the details of it. Like certainly before, even bef like certainly before statistical decision theory got formalized, people were doing lots of statistics, right? So, I mean, it, it you know, so, but anyways, it's a bit beyond my competence to, to, to describe exactly what that early history was, was like. So anyway, let me, let me go on. Um, um, so in order to uh, specify, you know, a lot of bread and butter statistical models, we, we do need some more structure though than what's in a, a Markov kernel. Um, so a lot of statistics is happening in um, Euclidean space or in some kind of structured subset of that. So you know, maybe it's happening in a in a convex in a convex cone, like for example, like variances or covariance ma matrices belong to those two convex cones. Maybe it's in a, a convex set, so you know, like the pr parameters of a Bernoulli distribution or of a multinomial belong to those kinds of sets. And sometimes you want um, the ability to count things, and so you know, you, you, you need some of this uh, structure in order to, to write down lots of models, okay? And so uh, these different structures here can be seen as uh, forming a, a, a lattice of different symmetric monoidal categories. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do is make a, uh, uh, we're going to abstract away from these to, to capture the, the algebraic structure that these different kinds of spaces have so we can put them into statistical theories. Okay, so specifically, each of these kinds of categories corresponds to a particular kind of, of, of theory. So here we'll treat them as, as uh, props, um, although uh, it's, Many of them are sort of naturally seen as, as algebraic theories. Um, and, uh, and then what we'll say, it will we'll extend an, a notion that was uh, introduced by Vong and, and Spivak recently to, to generalize the idea of a supply of commutative comoinoids. So we'll say that um, a supply of this lattice of different theories in in a symmetric monoidal category will basically be for every object in that, in that category, an assignment of one of these uh, theories. Um, and then a, a monoidal functor basically giving a, a supply of the theory at that object. And so, so the intuitive idea here is that uh, we want these assignments of different theories to be compatible with the monoidal product. So we insist that this assignment be actually a mind homomorphism from the, the monoid of objects in the monoidal category into the, into the, 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 the monoid structure given by meets in, in the lattice of, of theories. So let, let me just explain. So I'll, I'll, I'll show how that works in a concrete setting. Uh, shortly. So what we'll say is that a linear algebraic Markov category is a symmetric monoidal category that supplies this lattice of props in such a way that it's a Markov category. So in other words, 
every one of these theories contains the theory of commutative homonoids. So at any object, so, so it makes sense to ask whether a, a morphism in such a category uh, preserves copying or deleting. And so we're asking that it preserves deleting, making it a Markov category. Okay, and like any kind of category, you know, these come in, in the small as small categories and, and, and also in the large. So, so the small linear algebraic Markov categories are basically going to form the better part of statistical theories. And then we're going, to, and then the large ones will be where the semantics of theories exist. So let's start with the, with the semantics. Okay, so we're going to, uh, there's different ways to do this. Th this is kind of the, the uh, quickest and dirtiest way to set it up. There are, there are, there are other ways to do it as well. So um, we'll say that this category, which I'll just call stat for short, um, will have as objects um, a finite dimensional real vector space together with a, an arbitrary measurable subset of that space. And then the mor morphisms between those things will just be Markov kernels between the subsets. So we're just, we, we're just cre having those vector spaces so that we'll have an ambient vector space structure. And then the monoidal structure is given everywhere on, by the set theoretic Car Cartesian product. And we, as usual, use the independent product of Markov kernels. And then finally, the supply can, can be defined quite simply by just saying, well, given a subset, we'll say that it has the, that it's a vector space or an affine spa space or a conical space or what have you, depending on whether it's closed under linear combinations or only affine combinations or conical combinations and so forth, right? So that lets us get going quite easily. Um, and so let me, uh, let me just sort of illustrate this by showing how some very uh, some classic properties of the the normal family um, manifest here so um, the additivity property of the normal family which says uh, this becomes um, an equation uh, in, in stat that that basically says that uh, uh, the normal family is as a morphism is, is additive, it preserves addition. Um, so we can express that. Um, we can also express that the normal family is homogeneous in, in the sense, in this sense. So it's homogeneous sort of second order in the, the variance. And again, we can express that in a, in a purely algebraic, sort of algebraically in this, in this formalism as another set of equations. Okay, so in fact we can, um, and so I'll, I'll abbreviate these two properties of the normal family by saying it's sort of linear quadratic because it's 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 almost linear but actually not quite because the c is squared there. Okay, so actually we can sort of interestingly we can do better than that. We can actually within this setting present the isotropic normal family, that is the normal family with covariance proportional to the identity, um, we can present it by generators and relations. So, to, and what that means is that we can construct a, a, a small linear algebraic Markov category that contains a, a morphism of this form. Um, such that for any supply, pr supply preserving functor out of that into the category stat that assigns w y to be the reals and s to be the non-negative reals, then the, the Markov kernel must be the isotropic normal family up to an absolute scale. So up to an absolute scale just means that like it's, um, the, the, the standard isotropic normal family, except that there's a, some constant of proportionality on the, the variance. So that's what this last equation says. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me um, sketch how this goes. So there are different ways to do this. 
Um, one is to use a characterization, characterization by symmetry of the, the normal distribution. So um, a classical um, version of this, which is often attributed to Maxwell, um, characterizes uh, the, the normal by saying that a random vector is IID centered normal if and only if it's spherically symmetric, that is invariant under um, multiplication by orthogonal matrices and has independent components. And this was actually improved to, or simplified uh, later by Paglia to, to this result, which reduces all those, in the bivariate case, reduces all of those equations to just one, which says that if X and Y are IID random variables such that X has the same distribution as X plus Y divided by square root of two, then X and therefore also Y must be centered normal. So we can use these results in a presentation. Um, so uh, I won't go through it in, in detail. I want to keep moving along, but the idea is to basically use uh, one of these characterizations. So here, this, this equation at the bottom is the equation of Pauli's theorem, um, it, uh, showing that that can be expressed in a linear algebraic Markov category, and that in this sort of argument leads to the a presentation. Okay, so let's now get to um, the essential concept here. So having set this up, we'll say that a statistical theory consists of a small linear algebraic Markov category, T, um, together with a morphism in T, a, a designated morphism, and that will represent the sampling distribution. And then a model of a statistical theory is a, a supply preserving functor from T into this category of statistical semantics that we were just discussing. Okay, so in particular, um, you get a parameter space, you get a sample space, and you get a sampling distribution, just like you would get in the in the classical setup. Um, uh, one point that I want to emphasize is that th this will be obvious to people who, you know, are used to thinking about you know, logical theories, um, but um, in statistics, we don't usually think this way. So a statistical theory will in general usually have lots of different models and, and that's, um, that's okay and that can even be interesting. So let me give some examples of different statistical theories. So I'm gonna start by one which is the most, almost the most trivial possible theory. So th this is the initial theory and it's just generated freely by a single morphism um, on discrete objects, meaning that the, the supply is only of commutative comonoids. And the reason for stating this very simple theory is just to observe that any statistical model in the classical sense is a model of, of this theory. So one doesn't lose anything by thinking about statistical theories. I mean, usually you would want to put more structure into your theory so that it actually says something, but you, you can have a contentless theory if you like. Um, so a somewhat more structured theory, um, but still with many different models would be what I might call the theory of IID samples. And it has a sampling morphism, which is given by copying the parameter and then, uh, an and then doing an independent product of some other morphism. So in other words, this describes a, a sampling structure, which is, is an, an IID sample. So any model which can be seen as an, an IID sample is a model of, of this theory. Okay, so let's, let's do one that's a little more, uh, got a, has a little more meat to it. So um, we're go, let's go back to the theory of a linear model and make that uh, more precise. So there will be uh, vector space objects beta, mu, and y. There'll be a conical space object representing the variance. There'll be a linear map from beta to mu. Okay, so, so what, by saying it's a linear map, it's a shorthand for saying that I'm introducing a morphism 
x from beta to mu and I'm adding equations asserting that it's linear and that it's deterministic. And then finally, there'll be a linear quadratic morphism Q, um, which represents the random component of the model and the sampling morphism is the one we saw before. Okay, so in, in sort of the standard or intended models of this theory, uh, what does it assign? It assigns Y and mu to um, Euclidean space in some dimension N. Uh, that's the sample space and the parameter space is um, RP for some dimension P. The uh, sigma squared just becomes the, the non-negative reals. We assign the random component to be the isotropic normal family. And then, and then any assignment of, of X is fine. It'll just give you a, a linear map. And then by functorality, the sampling distribution is shown here, right? That, that's the sampling distribution of a, of a linear model. Uh, so, um, so to clarify my point about having multiple models, this isn't the only possible model of this theory. So another one would be a, what's sometimes called a weighted linear model, where uh, instead of having the um, variance be, or the, the uh, covariance matrix be proportional to the identity, proportional to some other fixed matrix V. Um, so that, that's, an, that's another model of this, this theory. Okay, and I won't, I'll do this uh, part quickly, but you know, it's, this is easy, you can easily extend this to talk about Bayesian theories if you like. So you just um, extend the definition of a statistical theory to include another morphism from the, from the monodal unit into the parameter space object, which represents the prior. And then a model of a Bayesian theory, so it would be defined in exactly the same way. And you get some additional things. You get the sampling distribution as before. You also get a, a, a prior distribution. And then um, by um, composing those, you, you get a, a marginal distribution. Okay, but let me keep going. Um, uh, about um, the sort of statistical models in general. So one nice consequence of, of this setup is that you get for, for free essentially the notion of a homomorphism between models, right? So um, specifically uh, homomorphism between two models of the same theory is, a, is a, just a monoidal natural transformation between them, okay? And you can, the, the requirement that it be natural turns out to already imply that the components of a homomorphism uh, are supply homomorphisms, which in particular means that they're always deterministic, which I think, which makes, makes sense um, usually. So to give an example, let's look at the morphisms of linear models. Okay, so we're gonna take two different models of the theory of linear models in sort of the, the standard form. So these will have two different design matrices. Um, one is n by p and one is n prime by uh, p prime. And then uh, fairly, you know, it, it's not too hard to do these calculations for models like this. You, you basically work out what, a, what, a, what equations are implied by the naturality conditions. And so what you find here, you work that through is that a model homomorphism is uh, uniquely determined by just two of its components, a linear transformation of the sample space and of the uh, uh, predictors um, in such a way that the, um, the, the transformation of the sample space is proportional to um, uh, an orthogonal projection and such that the design matrices are, are intertwined by the mappings. So in, in particular, um, an, an isomorphism of, of linear models will be uniquely determined by two linear maps, a conformal orthogonal transformation of the, of the sample space and a generic invertible transformation of the uh, param parameters 
such that the design matrices are equivalent as matrices um, under that under those transformations. Okay, so it's worth saying at this point that symmetry and invariance is is a is a classic topic in statistics um, that again you you can find in in the standard textbooks on decision theory. And I think an advantage of, of our account is that it does not um, have as many assumptions and that it, um, uh, it in, and it, more importantly, it, it does not, it's not restricted to automorphisms or even isomorphisms. So you get a notion of homomorphism which I think is, um, which is generalizes sort of some, some of the, the classic notions in, in a nice way, I think. So, but I want to uh, keep going. So I'm, I want to skip this because I'm going slower than I would have liked. Um, so I just want to point out that just like um, models are, um, uh, a theory can have many different models, so can a model, you can kind of reconstruct it from multiple theories. So for example, we can choose to make the number of samples explicit in the theory of a linear model um, by essentially um, breaking up the uh, uh, design matrix uh, by, by rows. And so then we would get a theory that looks like this. And um, a linear model would then assign the, the random component of, the, of the, the model to be just a univariate normal family. And by um, functorality, we'll get back the, the, the overall sampling distribution will be the same as before. But by changing the theory, you get a different set of model homomorphism. So now we get a more stringent notion of model homomorphism, which, which doesn't allow an arbitrary transformation of the uh, sample space, uh, but, but only allows a, a, a uniform overall scaling. Okay, and there are others. So you could, other ways to make a theory for a linear model. You could make the, the in addition to the two that we just saw, you could make the number of predictors explicit, you could make the number of observations and predictors both explicit. And so this, you might ask like, well, what theory is the right one? And I think the point of view of this work is that that's not the right question to ask, right? So as we've seen different theories admit different models and they also have different homomorphisms. So depending on what structure you think is important, you should encode that or not in the theory. But, but moreover, like, Choosing a specific theory doesn't preclude consideration of others because theories are related by morphisms. Um, so let us now discuss this notion. So a morphism of statistical theories is a supply preserving function. Yeah. The, sorry? Time, five minutes more. Okay, okay. Five, five minutes more? Okay, thank you. Um, is a supply preserving functor of the underlying categories um, that also preserves the sampling morphism, okay? And um, in a contravariant way, this induces uh, a migration functor between models of those theories. So this is kind of a familiar principle from categorical logic and other um, um, applications. So I won't uh, dwell on that, but what I do want to illustrate is how this, this works in the examples that I've given. So um, different, uh, uh, these different theories of the linear model, some of which I wrote, some of which I only mentioned, are related by uh, theory morphisms. So, so let me explain how to go from the original theory of a linear model to the one in which the number of observations was made explicit. So we map, the parameters mu and y in the in the first one to their nth powers in the in the second theory we 
break up the design matrix by rows essentially by sending the generator X into this composite on the right. And we, when we split up the, the random component of the model in the same way, and then we preserve the other generators. Um, and, and, right. Okay, so I don't have time. I was gonna do generalized linear models. Um, so if you like that, you can look at the slides um, on your own time afterwards. Unfortunately, I'm gonna skip this uh, and keep going. Um, I wanna talk about one more thing briefly. So um, the, uh, there's an, a notion of theory morphism which is weaker than the one that I gave and, and that essentially allows for the parameter and sample spaces of the two theories to, to change. And, and, and I think this is related um, both mathematically and conceptually to some of the ideas from McCullough's 2002 paper where he talks about um, the conditions uh, for, you know, the importance of having statistical models in which the, um, that can be extended to a larger set of experimental units. Okay, so a, a, a lax morphism of statistical theories is, as before, a functor between the underlying categories. But then in addition to this, we don't actually ask that the parameter and sample space objects are exactly preserved, but only that but that there are morphisms in the codomain category um, between the two, between what's assigned by F and what's actually in the, the theory that makes this following diagram uh, commute. So let me just give one example of that before I wrap up. So a very simple example of this would be, so let's remember the theory of IID samples that I gave um, earlier. Well, if I have, if I consider that theory for different numbers, I can get uh, a lax theory morphism between them. So the underlying category is always the same. So I can make the, the mapping on the, the, the functor part can just be the identity and the parameter space I can keep the same as well. But then I can apply a projection operation um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the sample space. Uh, and then the, the laxness equation which was that commutative diagram in the previous slide is just becomes this this simple equation which says that if I delete uh, the last n minus m observations I get back the other theory. Okay so to conclude here um, uh, so so what has happened in this work uh, so we introduced a notion of um, statistical theory sort of motivated by uh, the, the paradigm and categorical logic. We saw how you can recover statistical models as models of those theories. And we saw how that led to a notion of homomorphisms between statistical models. Uh, we then saw how relationships between statistical methods, at least some of them, can be formalized using the morphism statistical theories. Uh, and those can be uh, strict or lax or uh, strong. And we saw that uh, these morphisms also induce uh, model migration functors between the models of those theories. Okay, and I just wanna note that like, um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I think there's a ton of additional um, things to think about. So um, from a mathematical viewpoint, um, there's a lot more that could be done to understand the structure of these linear algebraic Markov categories. Um, it would be good to make formal the notion of composing statistical theories and models to get new ones. And I think there's lots to think about regarding software implementations and how it can be integrated, say, with probabilistic programming. So I will uh, stop there. If you want to read more, um, you can, um, do so in my PhD thesis, which is uh, on my website. And um, uh, one thing that you will find there is a much larger set of examples of statistical theories and models, right? So if you wanna see other kinds of things, 
I do some simple Bayesian models. I do generalized linear models. I do mixed models and some other things as well. Okay, so thanks very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much yeah, for your interesting talk. So, so Professor uh, Makulas, uh, I, I see that you have seven comments in the chat room. Yeah, um, if, if maybe, uh, let's see. Uh, but he's uh, the Professor Makulat is not uh, not here. Okay. So, I am here. Uh, yes, I'm here. So, so do you want to add uh, some comment? I, I'm happy to ask if that's okay. Uh, basically, I just had the question of whether the morphisms in the category uh, Markov a uh, category of Markov kernels mm -hmm. uh, allow you to. Uh, handle or automatically handle Kolmogorov consistency, which you would need if you were wanting to predict subsequent values in the process. Hmm. I have not thought about that. I, I, don't, I don't know. So I guess I should say as a, a general point, like this formalism um, doesn't, in this work, I haven't really touched at all on the question of like, estimation really just about the specification and structure of models so i think there's lots of interesting things to think about in terms of how that can of course interact with the essential task of of, of estimating and and fitting models um and, yeah. and prediction and prediction yeah 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 so so you know it, it, this is like a you know, this is a, a sliver of, of statistics. So there's yeah, a lot yeah. more to, to think about and do. Well, I have a question. Um, Evan, in your uh, definition of supplying that um, lattice of theories, yeah. um, when you have an object that supplies one type of structure and an object that supplies another type of structure and you tensor them, do you require that it supplies the intersection or like anything more than the intersection? Yeah, exactly. So let, let's go back to that. So uh, I, I did that part pretty fast. So, so yeah, the, by requiring that it be this homomorphism um, from the monoid of objects to this uh, monoid given by the meat in the lattice, that's basically what that's doing. It's saying if you take the monodal product of two things, then the structure that the product should have should be like the intersection of those two. And is that true in your, I mean, so then you gave some cases, you said, well, we just ask our thingies, uh, how much structure, are you convex? Do you have a vector space? Are you a vector space? And we, we, assign, the, we assign that amount of supply yeah. to them. Is it obvious that like, um, they never have a little bit more when you tensor them? Um, that's a good point. Um, I think it's true, but I suppose that needs to be, I suppose it would be worth checking that in, in greater, mm -hmm. in, in detail okay. to make sure it really, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously it has at least that much. It has at least that much structure. I, I yeah, I don't, yeah, that's a good point, David. I, I should look at that and make sure that that there's not something extra there. And so that, yeah, thanks, thanks for pointing that out. And so when you say that something is a vector space object or whatever, you're referring to uh, this exact yeah. diagram here, like what's, what it's supplying here. Exactly. So when I'm saying it's a vector space object, I'm saying that in this thing, you're assigning the theory of vector spaces you're signing that prop to, to that object. And so you want it to have that structure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, Professor Lavier. Yes. Um, yes. Thermal comments. Um, earlier, it was stated that uh, we obliterate the distinction between syntax and semantics. OK, maybe but that was quite, a little quite uh, Because uh, Syntax is basically uh, presentations uh, and uh, 
those are quite opposite in a way to the semantics. So this distinction was pointed out, I think, originally by Paul Hamos and his theory of uh, uh, modified algebras. But um, in the case of algebraic theories, it's, uh, it's stated clearly in one chapter of my yeah. thesis, which yeah. is uh, available in uh, in uh, theory and applications of categories that reprints. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say that the uh, idea of the uh, category probabilistic mappings. Mm -hmm. And the, the document that corresponding uh, to that was not part of the seminar, as some of the circulations say. Uh, essentially, it was a document submitted to the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency after suitable uh, checking that the Pentagon didn't disagree with it. Okay. Because because of the uh, the fact that. Uh, for for arms control agencies, have as a, as a side uh, responsibility the forming of uh, arms control agreements, and part of these agreements and must involve uh, uh, agreed upon protocols of uh, verification. And so the the idea of that paper what did not provide such protocols but it purported to provide a reasonable framework within which such a protocol could be formulated. Actually, I don't know if that ever got to be done or not. Um, at, at the same time, the mid 60s, uh, apparently the uh, this Russian aspect of the uh, yeah of the um, military industrial complex had a hint that this mysterious thing called category theory might be involved in the process of dip diplomatic agreement on such uh, protocols. And so uh, a, a former uh, person who, come, who concentrated on the uh, H-bomb uh, project was set to learning quote unquote uh, category theory and uh, eventually uh, produced uh, a book which was translated in Israel and seen by various uh, statisticians. Uh, it gave rise to a distaste on the part of many statisticians for uh, category theory. I don't know if this is this taste will be uh, reduced by this conference. I hope so. But um, the thing was that this uh, novice uh, categorist was had quite, uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the translation from Russian to English by the Israelis, but rather that the uh, um, the role Mathematical things in general, for example, whether a, a, whether a manifold has a boundary or not, are crucial uh, in, in, uh, crucial ingredients wrong in this book, as well as uh, part of the mystery involved, which may have been what turned off so many uh, uh, professional statisticians to category theory in general. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a turnoff that I think we have to consciously uh, oppose. Now, to change uh, the thing complete, completely, uh, there is one very famous uh, statistician, namely uh, Peter Huber yep. at Harvard, who made based on the initial contributions to category theory. That is, two Swiss, namely Cleisley and Huber published the crucial uh, constructions of what later became to be called monad and co-monad and co-algebra and all that. So in other words, used every day by uh, 
category theorists, and the, the hope would be that Peter Hoover would still be uh, uh, sympathetic, more sympathetic than some of his colleagues, to the use of category theory in uh, statistics. Uh, the well, further uh, further comment, if I may, is that the extreme importance of uh, closed categories and uh, categories enriched in closed categories yeah. has been mentioned several times here. Um, but in particular, um, it was my student, uh, Xiao King Meng, who, who worked out some of the uh, um, consequences of that point of view into looking into time series and uh, statistic, uh, statistical decision theories and so forth by making use of this enriched uh, structure. In particular, that the, the uh, category of um, um, convex spaces, which contains, of course, the uh, uh, probabilistic mappings as a full subcategory, that it itself is enriched in the category of uh, metric spaces. That is the HOM or two, two, uh, two uh, processes or whatever you call them has a, has a unique distance. And this is a, another, another enrichment, which is very important for all sorts of uh, limit theorems and, and the like. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I would advocate, uh, already several people have, have found this thesis of Cheryl King Mung as possibly uh, useful. And um, I would advocate that some others do that as well. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for all those comments. That's, uh, I, I didn't know a lot of that, that history and that's really, Interesting. So, thank, thanks, thanks for all those those comments. Okay. Um, is there some new comment? Question. Uh, if not, then let us thank the speaker again and close the session today. Of course, you can continue discussion. I see the many uh, comment on the chat room, but better to discuss in Zulip, right? Great. Yeah, we can discuss. We can discuss further on Zulip. Happy to do it. Thanks everyone for, for coming. Appreciate it.